This pilot's worst mistake ended up being his last. So check out the footage, and then we're gonna take a look at the hidden Russian investigation that revealed what really happened, including pictures from inside the cockpit. Now let's get started. So you can see when the video starts, he's doing some sort of barrel roll or rolling maneuver there, and he's basically gonna point down, head back towards the airfield, then he's gonna try to make a really tight left-hand turn to basically line back up over the runway, and that's when things go wrong. I'm Hoover and welcome to your pilot debrief. Now when you watch that footage, it might seem like the pilot's worst mistake was pretty obvious. He just maneuvered at too steep an angle of bank, too low to the ground, and was unable to recover. But there's a whole lot more to this story because as I started digging into the details, first I uncovered this hidden Russian investigation. And I say that it's hidden because this thing is 43 pages long, so I know it's got to have some pretty good details in it. It's in Russian, so I had to get Google Translate to work to try to bring it over to English and really figure out what was going on and what I found was pretty shocking because when you look at videos of this crash on YouTube or you find news articles talking about this they don't talk about a lot of the details that are in this report that I'm about to share with you but before we get into the details of the report the first thing that you need to know is that this aircraft is an AN2 Colt and you can check it out here on the Seattle Museum of Flight website now it was first flown back in 1947 they've produced over 18,000 of these throughout the years originally designed for you know civilian uses for for agriculture and uh, cargo, but later adopted for military use. And I know supposedly North Korea has about 300 of these that they would use to move troops across the border uh, in case they ever decided to invade South Korea. Now, over in Russia, some people refer to this aircraft as Kukuruznik, which I think I pronounced that correctly, which means crop duster, or fans around the world also know it as a Nushka or just Annie. Now, it's one of the largest biplanes that's ever been produced, and you can see what it looks like on the inside here. You've got room for two pilots, but it's not certificated as a multi-pilot aircraft, so you just need the one pilot to fly. And if you take a look at this instrument panel up here, this is something that I think I think a lot of pilots today, if you started flying within the last five to 10 years, you've probably never flown an aircraft with a panel like this before. You're probably used to, you know, the GPS and all glass cockpit type uh, setup. You can see there's obviously a lot of room in the back here uh, for cargo and things like that. And I'm going to show you some footage from the inside of the actual aircraft that was flown just prior to when it crashed. Uh, and the event that we're taking a look at here. And another thing that you need to know about this aircraft is that it is supposed to be very easy to fly and extremely forgiving, which is why it is rare to see it involved in a crash like the one you just saw. In fact, one of the things that's most interesting about it is that it doesn't have a published stall speed. According to the operating handbook, Basically, if the engine quits, you're just gonna pull full aft on the control column and keep the wings level. The leading edge slats will snap out at about 40 miles an hour. And then when you slow down to about 25 miles an hour, you're just gonna start sinking at about the same rate as if you're under a parachute. Now it's still gonna be a pretty hard hit on the ground, but chances are everyone's gonna survive that impact. Now what's also cool about the design of the aircraft is that you can go so slow in it that if you have a strong enough headwind, you can essentially hover or fly backwards. But the one thing that this aircraft is not designed to do is complex aerobatics, which is extremely relevant to what happened in this investigation. Now it is possible, as you can see in this video, to perform loops with an AN2 and to do other complex maneuvers, but again, it is not what the aircraft was originally designed to do. Now this video footage right here supposedly was taken on the morning of the air show before the incident took place, so it gives you a close-up look of what the inside of the aircraft looks like. Now according to the investigation, this took place on September 2nd, 2017 at an airfield just outside of Moscow. This was an air show dedicated to the 70th anniversary of the AN-2, so there were a lot of demonstrations, a lot of uh, AN-2 aircraft that were present at the time that this crash happened. Now, they say right off the bat that the weight and balance of the aircraft did not exceed the limit, so we can go ahead and cross that one off. The aircraft actually took off earlier that morning. It says 5.50, that's Zulu time, so it's about 8.50 local. It does a flight from uh, another airfield in the area to land at the airfield where the air show takes place from. Now, according to the instructions of the RP, which is the flight director for the air show, he did a pre-flight briefing with the crew, told them they could perform some runway passes and aerobatic maneuvers at an altitude of 100 to 600 meters, which is about 300 to 2,000 feet above the ground, without exceeding the 
speed limits established by the aircraft flight manual. Now this investigation said that they were able to find videos online showing the same aircraft doing acrobatic maneuvers at other airfields, but it's not clear if it was the same pilot or somebody else. And also keep in mind, like I said earlier, that according to the aircraft manual, it does not provide for the performance of complex aerobatics. When they looked into the history of the aircraft, they found that as of May of 2015, it had about 20,000 hours. But what's more concerning is the fact that its airworthiness certificate expired in 2012 and was not further extended. So that's five years before the air show. The engines had some repair work done on them back in 2008, but that overhaul expired in 2014, three years before the air show. Forms and for the aircraft and the engine have not been kept basically since 2008 and flights have been taking place on this without an airworthiness certificate. The pilot command is over 12,000 hours of flight time, but only 52 hours flying the AN-2, of which 44 hours are as the PIC. So that's not a lot of flight time on this aircraft. But what's more concerning is the fact that the last time he was an AN-2 PIC was between January of 96 and January of 98. So that's almost 20 years prior to this mishap. Now he's obviously flown a lot of aircraft since then, but his last official job as a pilot seems to have been as the captain of a Boeing 747 where he worked until June of 2016 and then he resigned. According to the investigation, the current PIC certificates do not contain a mark on admission to flights on aircraft A and 2. This is just a translation error. What they're talking about here is a mark of permission to fly the A and 2. The last time he got that was basically back in 2005, but that certificate expired in 2006. So it's not really clear when he got his 52 hours, whether it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And according to the investigation, the PIC basically tried to buy the aircraft about three months prior to the air show. There's no record of him flying it, but obviously he did a couple flights in it and he did the flight the morning of the air show to get to the airfield to perform in the air show. However, he doesn't log in any of that flight time. Regardless of all that though, this is not the type of pilot that you want performing at your air show. Now the other pilot that's flying with him has about 640 hours of flight time, but according to the investigation, he's never flown in an AN-2 before, so he has zero experience. And my understanding is that this guy's more of an aviation photojournalist than anything else. So the bottom line is that this flight was illegal from the start and just a terrible idea to begin with. Now there's no flight data recorder installed on the aircraft, but because they're flying with a GoPro in the cockpit and there's so many spectators at the event, the Accident Investigation Board was able to get enough footage to really piece together everything that happened from both inside and outside the cockpit. Now you can see what happens from this other angle here and it's pretty tragic to watch, but he's essentially doing a barrel roll at the start here, pointing downhill, trying to pick up some speed going back in the direction of the runway. And he's gonna try to do a left-hand turn to basically line himself up with the runway and fly parallel to the crowd. But if he had just gone straight ahead instead of making this turn, he'd probably still be alive today. But that wasn't the worst mistake that he made, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. First, if we go back to the investigation, it says that when he finished the barrel roll and started descending, his airspeed increased to 290 kilometers an hour, which is about 155 knots, and his vertical rate of descent was about 15 meters per second, or basically 3,000 feet per minute. Now, according to the manual, 255 kilometers an hour is the max allowable speed and level flight, which is about 136 knots. And this reference to 300 kilometers an hour, it's basically the structural limit of the aircraft. The manual also says that your speed and descent should not exceed 220 kilometers an hour. And remember, he's doing 290. So he's basically pushing the structural limits of the aircraft as he exits out of that barrel roll and starts that descent back towards the runway. Next, you can see in the photo here in the report that seven seconds before impact, he inputs full left aileron and he gets about 70 to 80 degrees angle of bank even though the max allowable bank angle, according to the manual, was only 45 degrees. So my guess is he probably exited that barrel roll a little higher than he wanted to be and a little closer to the airfield. So he's trying to solve too many problems at the same time in an aircraft that's just not designed to perform that way. It's not like you've got a fighter jet where you can just pull back on the control stick and pull some more Gs to try to square the corner. About four seconds before they hit the ground, he probably starts to realize this because that's when it says he pulls back on the control column, but he's still got 
full left aileron. So I guess he just assumes that he can just keep pulling back and hopefully he's gonna make the turn happen. And then two seconds before impact, he goes full right aileron and one second later, full right rudder. Now it might've been hard to see, but in the investigation, they provided this image taken from a spectator just before the aircraft hits the ground. And you can see that the ailerons and the rudder don't match the control inputs that he's making in the photos in the cockpit. And they discovered the reason for this was because he was going too fast and his angle of bank was too steep. So there was just too much load on the aircraft basically, which led to an increase in effort needed for the cable wiring to move the flight controls. So it was gonna take a lot more time to bring the aircraft out of that left-hand turn. And as bad as all of that seems, the truth is the worst mistake wasn't made by the pilot that was flying the plane. It was made by the pilot that decided to fly with him because he was putting his trust in this guy and he had no idea how big of a risk he was taking. And to top things off, he didn't even wear a seatbelt. So when they crashed, he was ejected from the plane. And if you learned something from this video, be sure to check out another one on the channel and I'll see you next time.